What do you think? That's the door's closed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sally. Welcome everybody to measuring your research. Uh, sorry, measuring your research impact and managing your research identity. This is my colleague Rachel Borchardt, and I'm Stefan Kramer, and we're going to reverse the topics that we're talking about for logistical reasons. So, I'll talk first about the research identity management part, and then Rachel about um, measuring impact. And I'll have to apologize in advance; I may have to leave before we are done here, at the, before the session is over. And we wanted to start with, since we have not so many people, but enough time, in all introducing yourselves. And say what you, you want to get out of the session. Yes. I'm Susan Schildermeyer. I'm from the library. And I get questions about this a lot. So I want to be able to do that answer them. Carly Clayton. I'm in the Behavior and Cognition Arizona PhD program. And I wanted to learn more about which types of journals to look at trying to publish and make some research impact. So, practically. <laughs> Excellent. I'm a fellow social director at the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. This is support, and uh, I'm here for two reasons. One, I support faculty research, and hopefully I'll be able to communicate uh, to faculty how they can increase their impact. And the second reason is very selfish. I do my research, <laughs> I do the research of my own, and I like to see how can I uh, my footprint bigger, if you prefer. <laughs> I'm Austin Hart. I'm in SIS. Uh, and as uh, almost new faculty, I'm still trying to figure out how to make sure mm -hmm. I'm keeping track of things like this as tenure eventually approaches. I'm Jeremy Jano. I'm a new faculty in the Department of Government. And for similar reasons, I'm uh, beginning my research and presentation career and should keep track of it. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you how many, raise your hand if you know what an ORCID is, the one without the H. Okay, that, that, saves, my, that saves my question, <laughs> question how, many has, how many of you already have one? So. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk about ORCIDs without an H. So we have, I'm going to approach this a bit from a theoretical background, if you will, or the, the state of scholarship in talking about an ecosystem of scholarship at the center, we have the researcher, of course. This is the famous granddaughter of Albert Einstein, refining the formula, probably. This is then the researcher has created, creates in the course of their career, ver various data sets, whatever the output form may be. This could be numeric data, this could be video recordings, interviews, um, images of the sky, what have you. And those are, of course, stored on three and a half inch floppies. We know, <laughs> we know that. Used to. Hmm? Used to, I think. Used to? You don't do that anymore? <laughs> okay. Just it's kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then, as um, another output, often after data analysis, you have the publications of the researcher. And the many of those are going into the hands of publishers and presses, which get involved in the publication um, dissemination. and selling. Then there's the researchers university and the university um, wants to know things such as what has this researcher published when it comes to promotion review and tenure decisions and so on and hopefully the university also is asking itself what does this researcher need in terms of support for m increasing the impact of their scholarly work including data set preservation, translating journal articles into other kinds of outputs, and so forth. And lastly, we have the research funders, and the research funders would like to know, and this is why this is all connected somehow, um, if we are funding this researcher for a grant with a grant, what kind of data sets are being produced from this research? Um, where are they? Where, how are they being preserved? What kind of publications? are being produced by this researcher. And if the funding agency cares about that, are these publications put into open source, um, open um, repositories for public downloading? And then outside of this ecosystem, um, others, other researchers perhaps want to know where do I find the data set that was associated with that researcher's publication. If they find a publication first, 
and see a data set cited. Or the other way around, if they find a data set first, they want to know, well, what publication was based on this. So there's a lot of questions that are floating around. And the way we are answering them currently, or have until very recently, are based on assertions that are subject to some ambiguity. There is not a very close linkage between these different elements of this ecosystem. And here, I'm just focusing on the one of authorship or creation. So traditionally, this is a typical bibliography in a publication. The way we have gone about identifying researchers was this way, last name, first initial or initials. And so by this method, how can we tell whether Langston M here is the same Langston M somewhere else? Could, there could be many people with that word combina uh, name combination, initial combination. Or is um, Lindsay E.B. here the same as someone who just goes by Lindsay E. somewhere else? Oh, that's already difficult. Now, when people, researchers, um, use different character sets um, for the ways they publish, they may, pu for example, somebody who's working in the United States but is from China might publish in Chinese, in Chine Chinese publications, in English, in English-speaking publications, and that will be, they may be very difficult to connect together because they're different character sets and maybe different forms of the name. Um, some Scandinavian authors have 10, 12, 16 different forms of their names, depending on how you abbreviate the middle initials and whether or not you use all the right Scandinavian characters. So for to rely on names um, to tie all these elements of the research life cycle and the scholarly ecosystem together is very, it's a very uncertain proposition, but that's what we've been doing up to now. So into to resolve these ambiguities, um, something has been coming onto the scene a couple of years ago called the ORCID, which stands for Open Researcher and Contrib Contributor Identifier. Um, I emphasize here re researcher as in scholar, somebody who publishes journal articles, books perhaps, but contributor is also here. That can mean a graduate student who's involved with crunching the numbers for a publication and gets perhaps only tertiary, if any, um, credit for the publication. So what this is, according to their own website, is an open, non-profit, and community-driven effort. Open meaning nobody other than the researcher owns the researcher's ID. It's not the property of a publisher or a corporation. It's a non-profit effort, so nobody makes money off of it. And it's community-driven. There's a lot of input from researchers, from libraries, from funding agencies, from research administrators, and so on, to make keep this going and make this system better. And it's interdisciplinary, and it crosses national boundaries. For example, if, if you look, I'm not going to show that here, but if you look how many in how many countries have ORCID's been created. Portugal is almost near the top, which is because now the national government of Portugal has mandated that it, every research output has to be identified by an ORCID. So every single Portuguese researcher who wants a cent, a euro cent of research money has to create an ORCID for themselves. Um, it is used in manuscript submissions. An increasing number of journal publishers are requiring ORCIDs now to identify the author or authors. Um, I think it stands at about a thousand journals now. Um, grant applications and increasing number of grant funding agencies now will um, require ORCIDs with grant applications and also for patents. And then internally in the university they all come also come into play in research profile maintenance. So at this university I've only been here for a year so I haven't dealt with FARS in great depth yet, but we have various research administration systems that identify you probably by your AUID and your last name. And so that's an entirely internal system. Once, if you leave the university, or if you come from another university, to tie your previous and past research into what you're doing here is difficult. Is it possible to, I know many faculty complain about FARS, and luckily, the faculty members. 
okay, that's part of the drug, I guess. Uh, you but, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. yeah, you have the uh, impression, I guess. But my point is, bars and orchids, are they integrated in any way? No, but they could be. So an increasing number of research administration systems at universities are becoming integrated so that I'm going getting a bit too far ahead of myself without, without showing you what an orchid looks like. Or okay. does. But so let me return to that, okay. how these connections can be made. So orchids have a role in a number of different places. Yes, Janice. You said there are a thousand journals that are requiring it currently. Is there a specific I don't know. I don't know actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, I don't. I haven't looked at the list of journals. But I would suspect it's m perhaps more in the hard natural sciences, medicine. Okay. Yeah. That would and be I can kind of follow up question. So they adopted orchid, which basically means if I get published in these journals, by default they will populate their ba ba da uh, database. Is that the case, or I need to go and manually opt in and enter my publications? I would suspect that may vary with a publisher, but I would also think that by de the default is that you have to create your own or ORCID, and which is very easy, we'll get to that. And when you submit a manuscript, you have to tell them, this is my name, this is where I work, this is the title of my publication, and here's my ORCID, etc. Just one more piece of identifying information. You have that. to obtain. You have to obtain, I think, in most cases, yeah. yeah. Uh, getting all, well, I I don't want to get ahead of the discussion sure. again, but we're also getting to the area where universities create orchids for everybody there, or they require that graduate students create them when they submit their dissertation. So that's, but the landscape is varied with, with that, yes. Okay, so that's what an orchid is intended to do. And so what do you need to get one? Well, you can. all you have to do is go to this website here and all you have to enter to register for an ORCID is enter your first name and your last name and your email and choose a password and agree to the conditions. And that's the basic requirement for creating an ORCID. You may, you will find that ORCID, you can see that right here on the screen, ORCID ID. You may hear that too, it's like saying an ATM machine so there's that redundancy, but ORCID has now come to stand for the organization that, and that generates ORCIDs as well as the identifiers themselves. But because it also gets a little bit lost, some people will say ORCID ID, including the ORCID organization itself. So don't let that throw you off. So that's all you have to do to start. Um, I'm going to look at an example of one, which is my own, which in which I have put a little additional information so the result, the URL becomes slintlyorchid.org and then the 16-digit um, orchid that you have been assigned when you signed up for one. And then in here is the minimal, the minimal amount of information would be name and the email address is not shown here. The email address is used to identify you within that system and you can enter all the email addresses that are associated with you. You can elect if somebody else were to be qualified to update this record for you, a teaching assistant for example, that you get notified by, of that and so on. But so you see, what you don't see here is an email address. You see my name, you see I have chosen to put in application, uh, employment and education just because I wanted to see what all is there to put in, but what makes really the most sense is to put in your publications and other informal research outputs so that somebody else can more easily see, aha, this is the Joe Smith that I thought it was. And that is his ORCID ID because I know that work. And then you can link that to external websites like the UAU profile and to other places. You don't have to do that, but the more you do that, the more this becomes your scholarly record, if you will, a record about scholarship that is transparent, that is completely independent of where you work. This will be yours for the rest of your life, no matter where you work. Nobody, your organization that you work for, in this case American University, does not own this, you do. And for that reason, I think it's also good to encourage graduate students to do this as soon as possible, because 
especially female graduate students are have this problem very often that they get a graduate degree, they start publishing, then they get married, they change their name, and then suddenly that that link of the just the name identification is broken. So having an orchid early on can be very useful. And you can see here always how many orchids have been minted so far, created. That stood at 300,000 about nine months ago. Now it's almost it's over 800,000. So this is growing pretty rapidly. Blooming. Yes. And I have to, I will say that we are, American University Library is going to join the ORCID qua organization as an organizational member to support this because it's not going to run by itself. Which basically means there is some use that they will pay. Send money, please. Exactly. Yeah. So that is the current state of ORCIDs. You can see that at the top is the number of ident um, individuals who have created an ORCID or ORCID ID for themselves. You can also see of those only about a sixth or so have put in at least one publication or work. Like I said, it's not mandatory. I think it's a good idea, but then I'm, I work in the library. We like lists of publications. Um, and there are 4.6 or so million works um, put in there into this ORCID record, which means out of those ORCID IDs, about five is the average of works listed per person. Um, and DOIs, um, how many of you know what DOIs are? So Digital object identifiers, you will have seen that, you will see that in many journal articles, so they get assigned as a short URL to the journal article so that it doesn't depend on the URL to get into the journal article, but this short identifier should persist even if the journal moves to another publisher or to another website. So DLIs are assigned to a lot of works, primarily journal articles so far. So that's the current state of ORCID. There is another identifier for researchers that has been around for a while. Do you know how long? I don't know. I would say probably the 80s, which is when Science got started. Okay, so a lot longer. So ORCID is only a couple of years old now. Researcher ID has been put in place uh, about the time, I guess, when Web of Science went from paper to being in any sort of online. I don't know when they added researcher ID specifically. Yeah. Well, it's, old, it's definitely older. So researcher ID is another researcher identifier. That one is specific to um, the Thomson Reuters products, most prominently the Web of Science, um, which includes the Science Citation Index, the Social Citation Index, the Arts and Humanities Index, and now there's a Book Citation Index, and now there's going to be a Data Citation Index. So, as it says here, you might consider um, signing up for both. I haven't done that myself. Um, it's the difference is this is essentially, in in a way, it's it's owned by Thomson Reuters. So the identifier is this is generated by a commercial company tied to a certain product suite. Which but which explicitly makes money, <laughs> and if we contribute, they will make money out of us mm. potentially. I mean, well. in the end, it's going to benefit you because um, if you're trying to pull time cited for everything that you've published, which will go into in my part, it's going to make sure that it's the most accurate listings. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a way to control what's in that database. So when Rachel talks about measuring research impact, these Thomson Reuters tools are uh, at the center of measuring that. And we'll see it in action. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I won't put them down. I'm just saying um, there is a difference between the two. And as they say here, they are now complementary and researcher and Thomson Reuters is actually one of the organizations that contributes to the ORCID organization. Kudos to them for that. Let's see, and I think with that, oh no, not done yet. So um, we just talked about one form of a persistent and globally unique identifier, namely for researchers and research contributors, and that's the ORCID. <coughs> so there's something else that we're working um, on in the library, and that's looking down the road a bit. Um, DOIs, digital object identifiers, have been for a long time assigned to journal articles, but there's no reason why they shouldn't be um, assigned to other research outputs that you generate as a faculty member. 
such as maybe a slideshow or a research data set or a video recording so that that becomes as unambiguously and easily citable as a journal article that you might write. Uh, maybe a conference paper that you put in our repository a year or two before that becomes a journal article you want to be able to cite with a DOI as well. So we're looking into solutions for doing that. And that's it from me. Questions or comments about ORCIDs with or without H's? <laughs> There's beautiful flowers, really. They are. But <laughs> if not, so if yes. Is the ORCID record sort of available on Google automatically, or you know, has someone Googled you? Would that come up as part of the search? Oh, I haven't tried that. So if you Google the name plus ORCID to see whether they. I don't think ID? so. I've never found mine at least. Okay, I just don't know how, you know, if, if, yeah. if, if the you can search of ORCID to search the, the ORCID database. The, oh, the, the database is open to anybody. Yeah. So you can go in there and you can say, I want to search for, give, give me a name and we'll see if they have an ORCID. I should be in there. Yeah, okay. I hope. I'm one of the, like, so six million that haven't, put, or 600,000 that haven't signed any work. <laughs> But I did sign up for one. Okay, so this comes mm -hmm. up in relevance ranking order. Most this is most likely the person next to me based on the results we see here. Yeah. And anybody can search this database. See. <laughs> and <laughs> that, that, so you know she exists and she, she has an ID. That's all. Exactly. That's a lot, actually. Exactly. <laughs> um, I just wonder, actually, because, well, AU is very open and kind of fluid community. Lots of international scholars come and work in here. Mm -hmm. We've heard the story about Portugal. But how about Asia? How about yeah. Americas? Well, that's, yeah. a, that's exactly a very good use case because if they come from Asia, have published, have used their name in Korean, Japanese, Chinese characters a lot, published perhaps in that language, and they come here, um, ha adopt or whatever an American name quote unquote publish in English and go back to tie all that together I mean you can almost say it, requi it requires them to have an orchid. My point is so you have close to 830,000 right what is the geographical distribution of those uh, orchids? That's a very good question. Uh, so and uh, you know that will eventually yeah. give us uh, I'm going to make a note on that. Uh, yeah. I mean, that will give us somewhere. That, I mean, you mentioned there is statistics somewhere. Yeah. I'm wondering if they would provide the breakdown by country, even though what does that mean? I don't know because someone might be on sabbatical from here in somewhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. and, you know. I think they may not ha actually. I'm not sure that country is part of the orchid record because oh. you may move around and you don't necessarily want to update that. That, may, that could mean it becomes stale. So maybe the language ID can, or this is just English only. No, you, I saw some German no, no, uh, works that you cited. This is available in an, actually the whole interface is available in a number of languages. Oh, oh here it is, I see it now. So it's not just I see, I English, see. it's Korean. It's so if I have Bulgarian public publications, which I do, I'm out of luck. No, no, you can put any language any publication in any language oh in there. Oh, it's just the yeah, interface. This is just the interface. If you're in, okay, okay. If you're more comfortable with French, then yeah. you go there and go. Okay. Um, but that's an interesting. That there is a um, so there's an ongoing discussion of how much, as we like to call it in the library, metadata should go into right. an ORCID record, exactly. with okay. without going stale. One thing I notice is you can't search this for everyone at AU that has an ORCID, which would be really helpful from our perspective yes. um, to figure out like what researchers need to get ORCID. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's terrible for that. It's all designed to work at the individual I mean level. The registration yes. search for people, but not organizations, not countries. Right. Registration form is very simpler. Yeah. And obviously simplicity comes with ease. But you can but add information. Like Stefan says, I work at American University, but when I search American University, I don't get stuff. Not on. part mm -hmm. of the searchable metadata. Right. I think I think the I'm not even sure whether that has been talked about an affiliation field. I wish. I'm not sure <laughs> they have done that yet. Yeah. Okay. It, it's terrible. I can 
tell you. <laughs> so we need to send them more money. Okay. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, any, any other questions or comments before we turn it over to Rachel for research impact? Mm. Going once, going twice? No? Okay. I'll still be mm, here you. for a little while at least. Do we need to do anything to with a recording? Just I'll keep just going. Open up a browser, yeah. All right. All right. So, handout. I recommend taking one because we're going to go through a lot and it, um, it can be a little overwhelming the first time. So, I think before I even dive into stuff, um, the first thing to know is there are people in the library to help you with all of this, no matter what stage you're in. If you're a graduate student who hasn't published yet, if you're an established researcher who's looking to maximize their profile, what not, um, where are your partners to help you with this? Um, so my contact information is at the top. Um, whoever the subject specialist is, they can help you as well. Um, this happens to be my area of research, so I am the kind of default person that handles a lot of this, but I'm not the only one. Um, all right, so first thing to know, since there's a lot of, like these are actual links, and I'll post the um, digital version of this to the Blackboard course, so then they become clickable links. Um, but all of this information is also in the subject guide that's listed along the top, um, including where to find it, which is what we're going to do first. So this is the library homepage. Hopefully you've all been here by now. <laughs> um, and if you go under subject guides, and there's a whole section for faculty research, and scholarly research metrics is my guide. Um, there's kind of two basic ways to organize this. One is organization by tool, which is how the handout is organized, and then there's organization by the type of information that you're looking to get, which is how this is organized. So they're kind of cross-purposely organized, and I hope that's not super confusing. Um, but I'm going to go with these metrics because I think they're kind of easier to, to uh, ingest, I guess. Um, so there's kind of different building blocks for how to measure the impact of your research. Um, the very basic one is the one that most people are familiar with, which is how to measure the impact of an individual article, and that's time cited. Yeah? Does that sound familiar? Usually the more times you've been cited, the higher impact it is said to have had. And if you guys want to discuss like the, the issues with that, we can go there if you want. But <laughs> um, and as you guys have questions, you know, feel free to interrupt um, if you want to go on different tangents, I'm totally happy to. Um, so whatever you guys think would be the most helpful for you guys, I'm here. Um, so we've got article level metrics, time cited. We also have all of these articles appear, appear in journals, right? And so impact, um, yeah, impact factor is another thing that you hear a lot, yes, and wanting to publish in the best journals is done by which has the highest impact factor. Generally, there are lots of like the field of metrics comes with lots of asterisks everywhere, but the one that most people use is impact factor. So that's under journal art, uh, level metrics. There are some other ones and we'll go over those as well. Um, there's also journal rankings, which is taking a discipline, taking all the time, the impact factors and then ranking them within that discipline, right? So you can get like a top 10 list for psychology or for cognitive psychology or for social psychology or for anthropology and so on and so forth, okay? Um, Stepping up from that, um, we have the author level metrics, and this is when it starts to tie into what Stefan um, was talking about, but this is the sum of everything that one scholar has produced. Um, the main metric that's used there is the H index, and we'll talk about that. Um, so those are kind of the basic level building blocks, and then there's lots of other stuff. And those are all journal-centric metrics. Um, and it sounds like most of you are more or less anchored in journals. Not all disciplines are. Some are very book-centric instead of journal-centric. So we also have a tab for book metrics and how you can measure the impact of that. Um, and then other metrics that are starting to appear on the scene that um, aren't necessarily as widely adopted but are beginning to be talked about. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to start with the basics. So the um, article level metrics and start with the one that uh, was the basic building block that started this whole confusing mess. Thomson Reuters Web of Science. Okay, They were the first people, it's the same people that make the researcher ID. Um, they're the ones that came up with 
a way to uh, come up with time cited and um, the impact factor. Okay, so they create both of those products. So um, that's why they're the very first thing listed here. Um, so for a long time, they were the only game in town. If you wanted any sort of impact measurement, you went to Web of Science. So that's where we'll start. All right. Um, has anyone used Web of Science before? Yeah, you have. <laughs> um, Web of Science is a multidisciplinary database. You can actually use it to just discover research articles. You can type in a topic and find things throughout many disciplines. Um, it covers science, social sciences, and arts and humanities. It is known as the one that is the most heavily concentrated in science. They built this for scientists. It works best for science disciplines. Um, so stay tuned. We'll get to things that are less science heavy. <laughs> um, but if you just want to look up, uh, and I'm just doing a topic search, but if you had a specific publication, and you wanted the time cited, um, it's just going to list it right along the right hand side. Um, it automatically sorts things from the newest publication date, which is why we see that these first few publications are all time cited as zero because they're really new. Uh, but we can always resort it. So it's going to take that 1800 results that have the word bibliometric somewhere in there and resort it by the number of times they've been cited. I teach this to students a lot just because it's a really quick and dirty way to find like the most impactful papers on a given topic. But for right now. But is, isn't mm -hmm. this kind of self, self enforcing mechanism? And what do you mean by that? By that I mean like, okay, I'm interested in this topic and I can see, okay, this is the most cited work. I must read it. Absolutely. And therefore, you know, like it'll get cited even more. <laughs> you know, create somewhat artificial demand. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Well, and dirty, but it doesn't take right? Right. I would never tell students this is the only way by which you would figure out which the most important papers are, but what I usually tell them is that there's some reason why over two hundred people have cited this and it usually indicates that they were the first to do something. Um methodological papers, really good reviews that a lot of people tend to extract information from. Um, I mean but this is just like Google. Today the most popular video is this. They say, I must see this. And then mm -hmm. on the trip in second you say, this is crap. It, yeah. But then it increased the number by one. But it doesn't, it's not an indication that it's necessarily a good paper or mm -hmm. still true just that other over 200 people have found it relevant to their research the level of citing it. That's what it tells you. Right, right. So that's why it's quick and dirty. Right. <laughs> it can be, but it is one of many tools at your disposal. Um, but the, for the purposes of being the researcher, it means that you can look up your individual publications in Web of Science, find the number of times cited, and that's usually something that you would include um, in any file for action such as tenure or three-year review. Yeah, that's a great question. Working papers or like the working paper I've got posted on my website. What's how far down the ladder? Yeah. Um, so um, we can kind of so there's a kind of a sister product that'll um, illuminate that a bit more. But Web of Science has their list of journals, and it's almost all entirely journals. They do have conference proceedings, which is a separate thing that we subscribe to, and as Stefan was saying they have a book database, they have a, a data database, um, but the core of where this is pulling from is other journals. Um, so it's looking at the journals that are on its list. Um, so this is not necessarily going to be complete or highly accurate. Um, as I said, if you're in a STEM field, this is going to work for you much better. Um, but they have their own internal qualifications for what goes on Web of Science and what doesn't. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience, in my field, it is just terrible. Almost zero library science journals are in here, even ones that are highly influential in my field, just because they don't meet the criteria set by Web of Science, which is why we have alternatives, which we will discuss. <laughs> but this is the, the one that started it they all. They consider library science as a science, you say? Well, they consider it a social science, but they lump it in with information science, and the vast majority of the things within that discipline 
are not things that I, as a librarian, actually use in my discipline. Just because how I think what's impactful is so totally different from what they think is impactful. It has a lot to do with, you know, the nature of scholarly communication. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> not really worth getting into. Um, but that's time-sided. Um, the other major thing that um, Web of Science can pull for you is an author level metric. It is the basic and the standard author level metric, though it is mainly used, again, in the sciences, and it's called the H index. Um, so what the H index is, is um, it's just a metric and it's designed to measure quality over time. It is, H stands for the number of publications that that, produce, that scholar has produced that have each been cited H number of times. So an H index of 30 means that that uh, researcher has produced 30 articles that have been cited 30 or more times each. Make sense? Okay. Um, to get that, what we need is not an individual um, title, but we need an author search. The easiest way to do an author search, and this will seem a little crazy, is to look up any of their publications, and then you'll see they have a hyperlink um, hyperlink with their name. This is the researcher ID at work that Stefan was talking about. So they pull together everyone's publications, no matter what institution they came from, and put it all under this hyperlink. So if I want to see... Mm -hmm. But this social ID, I mean, like this is researcher's ID, mm -hmm. Is it just unique across all of the databases? This is, uh, it's a Thomson Reuters thing. So Web of Science is based on Researcher ID, Researcher ID is based on Web of Science, but they don't, none of the other products are allowed to use it. It's owned by them. Right, but my point is, is it unique just like, you know, I have social security and it's yes. not good as soon as I leave the universe of yes. the United States? Um, they try and um, assign everything that's appropriate that they think is you, but they don't always get it right. So one thing you can always do is look up a publication, click on yourself, and then actually go through and see everything that they have listed for you and make sure it's actually you. But do I have, like the great core industry, do I have option to go and tell, by yeah. the way, you've missed half of my publications? Yes, absolutely. That's the researcher ID URL that Stefan linked to. That's where you can make those okay. changes. Um, but yes, you can request changes. So it, you do have some control. <laughs> anyway, um, so I've now done a distinct author search for uh, this guy who's very influential within this field. I see he's published 146 times. What I'm looking for is this create citation report. And it's going to take everything that he's published and give me some higher level metrics. Yippee! Numbers! <laughs> um, so first it's going to list everything he has by average number of citations per year. So you can see the articles with the highest trajectory, which is kind of interesting. Um, but what I'm after in this case, H index is right here. And again, the H index is going to be based on the publications that it found in Web of Science. And that is actually really critical because um, we can take this and look at him in all of, so there's three main products that all calculate H index based on time cited. They're usually different from each other. Fun, because remember that core list of journals that I was talking about? The core list changes um, between each of the three products. So they're going to find different publications, different time cited based on those publications, and therefore calculate a different H index. Isn't that fun? <laughs> yes. Yep, so we currently get back through 1978. I think we just put in a request to get five more years. So we may or may not, that was in our budget ask. So we're trying to get more years back in time. Um, we don't, like they're all insanely expensive to get little five-year back files. Well, um, that's, that's what I said. I didn't mind when I said they make money off of us. Yes, they do. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's a shame, but because it is what everybody uses, we don't really have a choice in the matter as of right now. Um, so yes, their actual citations go back to the 60s. We at AU have access back to 1978. 
Um, I, there are a few other consortium libraries that do have access further back. So if you ever found yourself in the situation of needing citations from the 60s or 70s within Web of Science, you can go to one of them. I know Georgetown, I think, is the closest one. But it doesn't come up too often. None of you are probably publishing too much farther back than 1978. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th that's the basics of what you can do with Web of Science. So again, time cited, H index, Web of Science. Eh? Questions? Okay. All right. Um, so I think we're going to skip from there to its sister product. And if you go, no, not under my tools. Uh, it's somewhere, but I'm going to go to here. All right, so, uh, journal citation reports. So number two on your <laughs> list, it's using the same uh, core set of journals. It's the same, they sometimes call it Web of Knowledge, sometimes call it Web of Science. It's pretty much the same thing at this point, but it's all owned by Thompson Reuters. So instead of coming up with time cited and H index, this is the one that calculates journal quality. Okay, so journal citation reports, impact factor. This is where you find it. All right, um, so once you're in here, um, you have a few options. You can look for a specific journal if you want to know what's the impact factor for X, or if you want to know what are the top 10 journals in X discipline. Um, or you can view all journals if you're a little crazy. <laughs> uh, the first choice you have to make is science or social science. Notice there's no arts and humanities. Um, as I said, and I'll keep saying it, it's very STEM heavy, which we're about to kind of see in action. Um, so I'm going to go with social science since it sounds like everyone's here yeah. more in the social sciences vein. So we're going to view by subject categories. This is the discipline list that I was talking about. There is no way to change this list, so I can show you the library or the information science and library science. I would love it if they would split them apart. Um, but we're just kind of bound by whatever disciplines they set for themselves. So let's go with psychology. Eh, not bad, right? <laughs> they have some. They don't have cognitive, um, per se. Um, but say international relations, uh, there's no subcategories, per se. It's going to be all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so they do all end up in one database, so it will show you if an individual journal is listed in both science and social science, but if you want to come in this through the discipline way, um, you want to do, you have to go back to welcome, science, submit, and then I believe cognitive sciences is not here, but clinical neurology is. Um, I think that there is one psychology thing that's in here, if I remember correctly. Da, 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 da. So if you're not sure, it's good to look at both. Uh, most people will fall into one or the other. All right. Um, anyone have a one that they want me to look at? What discipline? Don't care? All right. International relations work for everyone? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, so this is for 2013, by the way. And that's a good thing to know. And one kind of takeaway for especially new researchers, you usually want to capture the impact factor for the year that you've published it. So if I published something in 2007, I don't want to go back and say, well, this is the impact factor for 2013, because that's not when my article appeared, right? Because they can, you know, vary over time. Um, so after you cite something, come in here and check on it. Um, okay. So what I'm doing, I've picked a category, and now I'm going to view by impact factor. So that's going to give me my ranked list. Yay. And because they're Web of Science and they like making things difficult, they like using abbreviations. Um, hopefully, by this point in your life, you could probably figure out what they are. If not, click on the um, journal well, title. Pardon? Sure. Oh, okay. It'll give you the, the full title here. Um, but we can see the impact factor. There's also a five-year impact factor. I don't see that used as often. Um, and I should probably now take a pause and say, what is impact factor? <laughs> Which I forgot. Um, it's listed down here. But it's a three-year measuring period 
of essentially how many times have articles in that journal been cited within a three-year period. So cites within the year 2013 to everything that they published the previous two years, right? So they published 259 articles in 2011, 146 articles in 2012, and all of these articles, 405 of them, um, were, oh, sorry, this is the number of citations to those articles. This is the number of items that were published. Sorry. Yep. So they published 66 articles. Those 66 articles in 2013 were, pu were cited 259 times. Same thing here. 55 articles in 2012. Those 55 articles were cited 146 times. So essentially what this becomes is an average number of citations per article within that time period. Make sense? So each article has been cited a little over three times. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it, right? This is how we, anyway, sorry. I'll keep my rants to myself. Um, but the higher the number, the more citations on average the article is receiving. Um, one thing that's good to know Impact factors and what's on the top and what's the average for disciplines varies tremendously depending on the discipline you're looking at. Um, I'm just wondering because this is kind of, how shall I say, relative yes. ranking on a very technical basis. Yes. And then uh, you have Delphi method of evaluation the same phenomenon that you can say you take experts from the field, for example, mm -hmm. where the national organizations say in this field, these are the, this is the must publish, you know, mm -hmm. journal. Yep. And I wonder what is the level of discrepancy if there's any publication. Because this could be very misleading. Indeed. <laughs> Especially for the Dean of Academic Affairs. Yes. Um, this is kind of, and if you want to know a bit more about the uh, history of the impact factor, it was actually created by a librarian as a way to, for librarians to figure out which journals we should be subscribing to. It was oh. never actually intended to be a way to measure researchers' impact. But because it's a very simple way to, at a glance, compare many things at once using numbers, administrators really like it. Um, that's part of why we have other tools now is we have options for how this gets measured, but ultimately people really like numbers. Well, um, which basically reinforces my suspicion that I go to the library, I found only those journals. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the only we thing we do. <laughs> and we can find them only them and we can reinforce the citation eventually. Um. <laughs> Well, there's, you can always request any journal article that we don't subscribe to. Um, also, as faculty, you are always free to request that we can purchase journals, and we do a lot every year to the extent that our funding will allow it. So, um, yes, we do try and, and have the journals that we think more people are using, and those tend to be the ones that appear higher on the list but we're not trying to bias you or your research in any way. We just want to make everything available. Mm -hmm. I believe there's a way if you mark all. Um, my recollection, I haven't tried it in a while, is that I think you have to actually log in to be able to download. Um, but you can always do a screenshot. <laughs> mm -hmm um I have seen an unpublished report that shows the averages per discipline I've never seen an official um, usually it's kind of beholden on that researcher to establish an appropriate context um, like Asen was saying there are some disciplines that say Never mind this, these are the journals that we have found valuable. I know some disciplines have actual surveys, um, and from those surveys I say these are the, re you know, the resources that people in our field are using. Um, but how a discipline goes about that really widely varies. Um, and what I can say 
is that the closer you are to the sciences, the more they tend to stick to these, and the farther away you go, the less they tend to be a good and accurate representation, and so the more you might want to um, come up with other ways to describe it. I know that's not terribly helpful, but <laughs> that's, uh, it's, it's helpful to know that there's not an established person. Yeah, um, I get that a, a lot. But this is about as close as you're going to get is the discipline specific lists. Yeah. Um, because at least within that discipline, you can establish some sort of standard. Just imagine the dean of academic affairs calls you because he or she is the one who makes the shot call, you know? Will they use this? That's a much better question for them than it is for me. From what I hear, this is part of it, but not the only thing that they use as an indication of uh, that's comforting, I would say. That's what I hear. Don't quote me on it. And I should also preface this by saying any way that you use anything that I tell you is ultimately on your hands. <laughs> I am not responsible for any outcomes or decisions that are made. I don't evaluate files. I just tell people how to use these tools, which you can use in any way that you see fit. I'm happy to help you with that process, but don't sue me. <laughs> so I guess what I want to say. There's some other like uh, scoring system. It's not just like uh, and how many columns we have right there, from the impact factor, by the impact factor, all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. Article influence score. Don't know how they created any view. You rank them by article influence score. It's different. It's different. Yes. And perhaps it could be dramatically different. Um, I, I will be honest, the eigenfactor and article influence aren't things that I am as familiar with because I have literally never seen them used. <laughs> but um, I think when you're using something like that, and I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying if you are, you should probably provide some reasoning for why you would use that particular metric. And that's pretty much true of any, anything that you are using to justify your impact. Um, yeah. Anyway, other questions about Web of Science journal citation reports? Okay, then what we're going to do is move on from the people that started it all to the people that created the direct competitive product. Um, so we'll start again with article level metrics and then go through the same process that we did, article, author, and then journals. All right, Scopus is the main competitor. Um, we are actually very lucky at this institution to have both most institutions have one or the other. Uh, the reason, one of the main reasons we have Scopus is to support researchers such as yourselves, especially ones in social sciences. Scopus is known to have much broader coverage outside of the sciences. Um, all right, uh, let's do the same. Bibliometrics, one of the big downsides, however, is that it is a much more recent product. It started in 1996. So ev all the citations and everything it's pulling from um, started in 2006, or 1996. And look, we only get two results. Did I? Ah, there we go. How interesting that it even pulled up two then, right? <laughs> Thank you. Bib. Hello? There we go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> there, 7,000. That's better. Um, so same thing, cited by the automatic site, um, listing is by date, and I can change it to time cited, or as it calls it here, cited by, to cr again create that topic-based uh, citation. So this, mm -hmm. this is a, a more recent, this came up 7,000 as opposed to 188, is that because it's searching Many more oh, social right. science journals. So it's got a bigger base rather than just a broader search. You know. It's not necessarily bigger than Web of Science, but it's uh, more diverse, especially when it comes to the social sciences. Yes. So for all of you, I would highly recommend looking in both. Um, and if you want to be really complete, what you should do is see exactly which of your publications appear in which database. There will be some overlap, but chances are there will be unique titles. 
is it accurate to say that the previous search is in fact within the field and this is the spill over? Both of them. The both of them, these searches are searching everything that's within that database. It's that Web of Science has a lot more science journals in its list of everything that it's searching, while this tends to have more broad coverage. Um, so this seems like it's more interdisciplinary. Both of them are. It's just this will come up with a lot more non-science yeah. things. Yeah, that's what I had in mind. Yeah. The first one is focused within the field, science and like journals within the field. Pretty this much. does as well. Okay. Um, it's just it focuses more okay. in the social science fields. But you can see our highest cited by was 200. And the other one, this is 1,500. So it is a pretty remarkable difference. Um, I'm going to see if Bergstrom, I'm trying to find that same researcher so we can do a direct comparison, but I'm not sure if he's going to show up on any of the really high, highly cited articles in here. Is this him? I can't remember. Let's just click on him. <laughs> no. Yes, Eugene Garfield, yeah. <laughs> He actually writes, many of his articles are about why you shouldn't be using the <laughs> impact measurement he created. <laughs> impact well, factor. Well, because it's, it's become an easy way to overly simplify in wrong ways, as you were pointing out. Anyway, he's a, he was a librarian. You know, um, This is a different person. But similar thing, if I click on somebody's name, I'm going to get the author. They also have a Scopus author identifier. Um, if I click it here, it tells you a bit about it. Um, when you do an author search in here, if you see, actually, let's just do that so I can show it to you. Author search. They're a little better in here about being able to search. Um, oh, now I can't remember her name. Shoot. Well, let's just do. Oops. This L field key is a little sticky. There we go. So Eugene Garfield. You usually want to do just first initial because often people are cited by first initials rather than full name. Um, but you can see he's here. Um, this, I think, yeah, this should be him. This might or might not be him. But you can see there are variations. Um, Chemical yeah, that's Chemical why I wasn't sure if it someone else. Was it he Maybe it's not it? him then. And this one I'm not sure, but he, he actually, a lot of his publications end up affecting those individual disciplines because okay. it's things about like how you measure impact within chemical engineering. Um, so let's put them all in, sure. But the point being, there's this little request to merge authors. So with researcher ID, you have to go into the researcher ID system. With this one, it's actually within Scopus, you can um, maintain control of which ones are actually you so that you can get all of your publications within one author name instead of having to do what I'm doing and merging them. So I clicked on everything I thought was him and then show documents and now I've got them all federated together. All right, um, so I can get all the time cited. Woo, 814, see, he's a big deal. <laughs> 1972, this is Actually, I think this one is the one that started it all in 55. Anyway, um, so that's time cited to get the H index. Is that little analyze results guy right up there? And this will pull together all of his citations. He has a lot of them. <laughs> and it looks a little different. Um, actually, this looks a lot different. It looks like his impact is coming down. This is not where I meant to be. What is this? Okay, sorry, I'm gonna go back to results. I think I... That worked the last time I did it. Hmm. Sorry, I'm gonna try this one more time. There we go, here it is. So I clicked on his name, eh. and that's where I get the H index. Um, and I can actually, I love this, can actually view the graph of how they calculated the H index, which sometimes can kind of help you visualize more. And you can see this document of his 
cited more than h number of times, and this bar shows you where the h index is set. So it's set right around 18. Anyway. <laughs> so if it helps you to kind of internalize the h index, you can do it that way. Um, but pretty similar to what Web of Science offers. Yeah? Oh. Yeah. So I think that helps answer your question, which was, can I auto-populate? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, so that's time-sided and h-index within Scopus. Um, if I go back to the search. There's this tiny little thing, analyze journals, which is how I can get the, um, their equivalent of the impact factor. So impact factor is owned by Thomson Reuters. No one else can call it impact factor. So Scopus instead has something that is called SJR um, and SNP. <laughs> I'm sorry. This gets so technical so fast. <laughs> SJR stands for Simago Journal Ranking, I think. I think that's right. Um, it's in here somewhere, I think. Mm. Anyway, um, so it's a very similar citation-based um, way of figuring out which the highest impact is. They don't exactly tell you how they calculate it, but they say it's based on a Google algorithm. Um, but you can rest assured that it's the same, they're trying to do the same type of um, impact measurements. Okay, so this is the direct competitor to impact factor, SJR. Um, I have seen people use this in their tenure files, but sometimes you need a little asterisk to explain what it is. Um, anyway, um, within Scopus, I, it's actually really difficult to just view, yeah, by uh, journal rankings. You can't do journal rankings, but you can do individual journals. So. So let's do, I shouldn't have chosen something with L's. <laughs> Come on, L, L, L. <laughs> there we go, sorry. College and Research Libraries. And here I get the SJR. Um, what I like about it is you can drag it over here and start creating a chart of the SJR over time and say I want to compare it to its sister product, College and Research Library News. Um, so I can directly compare journals in the same field, which is really cool. Um, so we have SJR SNP is based on SJR. Uh, it's source normalized impact per paper. Essentially what it is is a flattened version of SJR. Um, as I mentioned with impact factor, it, because the uh, impact factors vary so widely between disciplines, Comparing one discipline to another is very difficult. SNP tries to correct for that by essentially flattening between disciplines. Um, I can tell you from experience, it flattens somewhat, but there's still a pretty wide it's range. Still by something, but I don't know what it is. But yeah, and if you look in the science, like science SNPs will always be larger than non-science SNPs, but it's not as large a difference as SJR or impact factor. So. Um, so that's SGR and SNP within Scopus. And then if you want journal rankings, number four on the list is actually a free product. It's the first free product we come to. <laughs> so these first three are all things that we pay for through library subscriptions. Um, Simago is actually a research like institution that they're the people that calculate SGR and SNP based on Scopus uh, journals and the citation information and then make it available to Scopus. So they have kind of a, a partnership, but they have journal rankings on their website. Phew. So instead of the flat disciplines within sciences and social sciences that we had with JCR, um, here we start with areas. <coughs> so we can start with psychology, and then this time experimental and cognitive. Um, they. They actually are very big on country rankings. I've never used this, but if you ever need to compare country outputs, <laughs> you can do that as well. Anyway, 
So within experimental and cognitive psychology, ranked by SJR. They also include this little Q1, which is just the quartile or the 25% range that that journals fall, fall into. So the top 25 are Q1, the next 25% are Q2, and so on. So it's kind of like a handy way to say like this journal is in the top or is not in the top, I think is why they do it. First quartile, second third. Right. <sighs> <laughs> um, overall, you'll find that the subject categories are, um, they have more delineations for the social sciences, which is a reflection of the journals they come from. Um, but not always, just depends. So, questions about that? Okay. One weird thing is that you cannot get SNP through their website. You used to be able to, but now it's only in Scopus. So you cannot get subject rankings by SNP, if you cared. <laughs> All right, ready to move on? Is your head exploding yet? I know, it's a lot. Uh, so the third major one comes as a surprise to many people. It's Google Scholar. Yes, they are in the citation and metrics game. We probably already knew that they have time cited. Most people like to use this as their handy dandy little sneaky way of getting to articles quickly and easily, but they have cited by as well. The frustrating or awesome thing, depending on how you look at about Google Scholar, is that it pulls from God knows where and God knows what. So you get not only journal articles, but dissertations. You get online bibliographies. You get unpublished art, uh, white papers. All there's a wide gambit. So with um, Web of Science and Scopus, they kind of carefully keep control over their list of journals that they Peer that are qualified. Yes, and that's one of the main um, criteria for appearing in Web of Science and Scopus. Mm -hmm. This has no such restriction. So I often, this is another little asterisk, if you're using Time Cited that you've pulled from Google Scholar, you might want to actually look through and see what those citations are before saying I was cited by 212 people because inevitably you will get like undergraduate research papers in that 212. Um, so it's kind of up to you to call it appropriately. But there could also be journals um, that aren't included in Web of Science or Scopus, especially new ones or open access journals. So it's a mixed bag. Whew. Um, for author, I'm just going to do myself. If that author has come into Google Scholar and created a profile, um, you can find it. And this actually kind of ties into what Stefan was saying. Um, so we've got ORCID. We have researcher ID. This is a third way for you to kind of be visible to other researchers and manage your research identity. Um, and it's a pretty visible one. A lot of people use Google Scholar. Um, so that's why I created one. But one thing that's really nice about it is you have complete control over what is actually assigned to you. Um, so the first time you make it, it'll say, are these citations yours? And it'll list anything that it thinks was close to your name. And you say, yes, no, yes, no. And that's how you come up with the list. But you can also add um, any new citations that you want to. So. Does um, it ask you, like, if, something like research gate, it says, you can add citations, but then they say, well, we have to email that person first to see if they really cited you. This is all like an honor system kind of thing. Yeah. I, it's the assumption is that you wouldn't put something that isn't yours, which I, I hope would be true. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can add anything you want to. Um, once you're in the author profile, it also calculates in H index. However, Keep in mind that H index is based on the citations, which we already discussed, may or may not be, you know, yeah, high quality. So um, if you want to be super thorough when you're getting your time cited and your H index, you might want to look in all three places and compare all three. It's kind of up to you. Um, I should also say H index is usually primarily a science thing. The more often that discipline is publishing, the more likely they are to be caring about your H index. 
Um, when you're publishing like once or twice a year, the H index is never really going to get all that high. So there's not really going to be that big of di discrepancy, right, in an H index from someone who's published like in six years. Does that make sense? Um, so it doesn't really tell them very much, but it's there. I tend index. Um, they're the only ones that have that. It's just how many articles you've published that have been cited more than 10 times. So it's a very flat measurement where H index is a very, like, I don't, I don't know what that relationship would be called, but not flat. Well, <laughs> reshape the distribution. Yeah. Cut the left hand side of the tail. And the last thing that Google Scholar does from their homepage, there's a little section for metrics, right? So we can get time cited, we can get H index through Google Scholar, and through this metrics part is where we can get the journal rankings. They don't use time impact factor, they don't use SJR, they have their own um, thing that they've done, which is actually H index. <laughs> Ta da! Um, so they call it the H5 index, but it's the same exact principle as the H index. Um, five indicates that it's a five-year period, but it's the number of articles within that time period, within that publication, that have been cited that H number of times. So within the past five years, 355 Nature articles have been cited 355 times or more. And that's why they're number one, because Nature is huge. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to find lists, you start with these very large basic categories, but their subcategories I find to be the most granular um, outside of the sciences. So even more so than Scopus. And like within Scopus we had history, but here we have Asian studies in history, Canadian studies in history, Chinese studies in history, plain old history, right? So um, I suggest checking all three and seeing if there's one that most closely describes your discipline because it's going to be the most at least accurate listing of journals so that you don't have journals that aren't actually impacting your discipline. It looks like Google grows from the data sources from the entire world. It uh, and the entire world in this particular means the entire internet world, yeah. but also the entire world of scholars, including students. So yeah, it one of the frustrating things about it is it won't say where it is and is not drawing from. It's a completely black box when it comes to Google and Google Scholar. Um, but it's, you can rest assured, it's pretty much drawing on anything it can get its hands on. <laughs> anything it can get the data for, it's throwing in there. Yeah. Um, anyway, so let's, just, uh, I don't know, let's just go with history. So H5, oh, and so H5 index is H index. H5 median is so we've got these 22 articles in the past five years that have been cited 22 or more times. Uh, of those 22 journal journals, if I lined up all of their citation counts, the median citation count would be 33. So it's kind of like a how far beyond that bar of 22 did they actually hit. Does that make sense? So if like the median was 23, that tells me these papers, there's like half of those papers that are above 22 are like 22 or 23 citations, right? And the other half, who knows? Because it's just lining them up and picking the middle number, and that's medium. So, an entirely different way to do it. Um, overall, like, nature will be number one in any of those three categories, so there is some consistency, but there will be differences between the rankings. Fun, right? <laughs> Um, another thing that I have also seen people do, uh, this is the only one that does it, you can search for a list of journals by keyword title, title, keyword, or whatever. So like I could do cognitive. Any um, article, or any journal title that has the word cognitive in it will appear. So I could also say like if my area is cognition, I could say, but there's no good like discipline ranking for cognitive sciences, I could say this is something I kind of created as a stand-in, but I assume things like human brain mapping would also um, be an influential journal that wouldn't appear on this list because it doesn't have the word cognition in it. So it's a very, very crude system, but I've seen people use it. Is there any keyword in the paper itself or just the title? Just the title. Yep. That's the only data it has, essentially. I know. 
sucks. <laughs> I mean, you can also kind of like come up with things by hand and I think like one of the other big takeaways is this is the tools as we know them, but talk to people within your departments. Um, there's almost always some kind of best practices or like previous templates of other people have put in files or like things that are standard within your discipline that I don't know and can't teach you. So there may be a list of these are the journals that are actually influential in our field that don't line up to any of these, but asking around should help illuminate that. <sighs> All right, so with that, those are the major journal metrics. Yay! <laughs> the one that we did not cover is Cabell's. Um, it's one that sometimes people use as kind of a, a last ditch effort, especially when people are publishing in very new journals. They may not appear in any of these. And you're like, but it's a journal. I promise it exists. For some disciplines in Cabell's, it'll show um, the overall uh, percentage of acceptance rate. Um, and that's something that people use. Cabell's only covers a few disciplines. If your discipline isn't here, usually emailing the publisher, um, they can give you that. And people use that as a, a metric of quality as well. Okay. We only have 10 minutes left, so what I would say is if you're interested in moving beyond that, that's the back of the sheet, but let's talk about that one-on-one -on -one at another date and time if you're interested, because I think I've talked enough. Is that cool? <laughs> yeah. Do you guys have questions about anything about managing your research identity, increasing your research impact? I guess that the part that I is kind of assumed in all of this is that it's good to look up this stuff as you're making those publication decisions. Um, to you know, because impact factor is not perfect, but people are always impressed by it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Say in an earlier publication, you use your initial and later one you don't. Do you have control? You showed us that with maybe with Thomson Reuters ones, you can go back and say, no, I really am both of these people. It was Scopus. Yep. So could you do the same with these others? And is there some way to contact the people collecting the data and say, I'm both of these? With Google Scholar, it's all up to you. You do it. You don't have to contact anyone. You just add it or don't add it to your profile. With Scopus, there's a requ request to merge. Um, I have seen it in Web of Science and I can never find it. Um, what I would... Yes. Yeah, and I'm not sh I think it's in the researcher ID section if you like log in and claim a researcher ID. Those are the kinds of things you can change, but I've never done it because I don't have any publications in Web of Science. <laughs> um, do you know, Stefan? Okay. Um, what I would say is if, um, if you have that situation, email me. Um, and I can figure it out and get back to you. But um, yes, there is a way. I just don't know it off the top of my head. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere there exists a way. Other questions? Do you feel moderately more empowered? about strongly more empowered. Good. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, if you guys ever want one-on-one -on -one help, um, I am more than happy to meet with each and every one of you and, and walk through any or all of this again, help you with your own profiles, publications, etc. We're here to help, so don't be a stranger. <laughs> Thank you both. I take some pins and bookmarks and orchids. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yay.